out there in nostalgia land. I'm Chuck Shaden, and we've taken our nostalgia camera to Townhouse TV and Appliances in Niles, Illinois, where we're going to set the stage for an hour of memories related to model railroading. We'll be talking with Mike Moore, who knows all about the Lionel Company, and we can talk a lot about Lionel train collecting. And we'll be talking with collector Stan Roy, who has the most amazing layout you've ever seen. It all begins in just one minute, so stick around and don't touch that channel. There's an old-fashioned warm Christmas spirit at Townhouse TV and Appliances. Maybe it's the smiles that greet you. Maybe it's the dolls. Maybe it's the Lionel train. Let a good memory from Christmas past, Lionel, make its way to Christmas present. This Christmas, why just give a toy when you can give a tradition? Lionel. Come to the superstore, Townhouse TV and Appliances, Milwaukee and Austin. Share the experience the candidates need and to unlock the memories hey, hey, at Chicago's Museum of Broadcast Communications. The and for the latest uh, local results. Celebrating the very best in radio, television, and advertising. For membership information, call 565-1950. Chicago's new Museum of Broadcast Communications. Come share the experience. It's the night before Christmas. The family's at the fireside. And the children, the hour is one minute before bedtime. Of all nights, of all bedtimes, this is the most difficult. For tomorrow is Christmas. And sleep is not for youngsters who wait for surprises. Conjure up fantasies of a giant tree, glittering with lights and tinsel, planted in an acre of bright new toys. And so later, when the children are in bed, sleeping fitfully to be sure, the scene is set. The big surprise unfolded. This year, Johnny will get his electric train, his iron pony. And mom and dad can't help but think of other Christmases, other surprises, other childhoods. It seems only yesterday to dad that he was bounding downstairs on a cold Christmas morning to find a toy train of his own. And now the staccato clicks on the rails and the gentle purr of the locomotive remind him of those early crude but wonderful models and the days when he was the engineer, Casey Jones Jr. himself. The old trains dad remembers have come a long way. The stem winders, the battery powered models, and the first plug-ins with transformers that got so hot you could scramble an egg on them are gone. The toy trains of today are a reflection of American railroad progress. Our guest is Mike Moore, who's the proprietor of Townhouse TV and Appliances in Niles, Illinois. And Mike, in addition to being a longtime friend, is a longtime collector of Lionel trains. Mike, what is the mystique about Lionel? Why do, why do people have to have a Lionel model train? Well, it all started in the year 1900, Chuck, Raquel, when they came out with the first electric trains for window displays. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, every kid has gotten one at Christmas. He put it away about the time he was 12 or 14 years old. And when he got to be a father, he found an excuse to buy one back. So it, it was for his children, but it was really for him. So what we've found is it has skipped a generation as we've gone along. Uh, the father says it's for the children, but it's really for him. His children don't appreciate it till they get to be a lot older and buy it for their children. Now when a dad comes in to buy a train set for his kids, the kid's usually too young to appreciate it at this well, point, certainly. right? What we normally do, especially when the wife comes in or the mm -hmm. mother comes in for a train set, we ask them, how old is the child? He says 43, right? That's right. <laughs> 43, 52, 36. Now we know exactly what they're looking for. Uh, it seems that the toys that kids have played with over a period of years have come, they've gone. The slot model cars, 
the uh, Atari games, mm -hmm. the electronic games. They come, they go, they come, they go. But every Christmas since 1900, Lionel Corporation has issued a catalog and came out with a line of electric trains, which you see right yeah, behind so they, us. They've never failed to issue to, uh, uh, a catalog or new trains. They come up with new trains every year? Have well, they done they're that? not necessarily new. They come out with trains and they're in the line for 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. Every year you get a different paint job. One year it's Union Pacific. The next year the same train can have a different paint job. Mm -hmm. You call the Pennsylvania or New York Central. But a different paint job and new numbers every year on the same body. Mm -hmm. So, but we have uh, in all these 85, 86, 87 years of Lionel trains, how many different trains have they come up with? Thousands. Thousands, Thousands over a period of years. And some of them will start out uh, at 1900 through about 1905 and fade out by the time you get to 1910. Mm -hmm. But something else has started at 1905, goes through 1915. There's definite periods of Lionel trains. Uh, the early trains, the ones that were made out of uh, wood, tin, handmade by Joshua Lionel Cowan. That was the man who mm -hmm. started the Lionel mm -hmm. Company. Those are from about 1900 through the First World War. From the First World War through the middle 20s, you had trains that started to look more like real trains, made out of die cast, made out of tin, but they had definite shapes to them. They weren't just abstract trains. During the 20s and 30s, you had the classic period of trains. You had the, probably the most beautiful Lionel trains ever made during the Depression. Mm -hmm. When people could barely afford $5 for a train set, there were train sets selling for hundreds of dollars that today are worth thousands because they're classic in every respect in workmanship and in features. Then you have the modern Lionel train set. The modern Lionel train set starts out at about 1945-46, right after the Second World War. And if you look at what we've got here, trains from 45 through 1986, very similar. Mm -hmm. Other than the fact that the last few years they've been issuing more diesel trains, because this is what the kids will see on the tracks today. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, most of the train sets issued were steam trains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When, what is the most popular period for Lionel trains? What was the peak of the, of the, the company's business? The peak of the company's business was in the late 40s, right after the Second World War, mm -hmm. through the middle 50s. That was absolutely the peak of the Lionel business. After that is when the kids started to get into slot cars and different toys. They never died completely, but they did start to wane in the 60s. In the 70s and into the 80s, now what we get are the people who were kids in the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who are now the adults who are going to get all these train sets that they couldn't have when they were a kid. They would come into a store like ours, see them on the shelf, and tell their father, I'd like to have uh, $700 worth of trains. <laughs> and the father would know why he could afford that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now the fellow's in his 40s and 50s, maybe even in his 60s. He can afford to buy these trains that he couldn't have when he was a kid. There's a saying in this business, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty much what it is. Nobody's ever happy with one train. Now, a lot of trains, you, you say, is very popular right after the war. Uh, during the war, uh, a lot of trains went into the scrap heap, didn't they, oh, for, yes. the, for the war right. effort? Many, many of the highly collectible trains mm -hmm. are, are just sold because during the 30s, mm -hmm. uh, when these trains were made, uh, when we came up with 1941, and you remember the scrap drives, and mm -hmm. everybody was taking their pots and pans, a lot of kids packed up their electric trains and tracks and took them to the scrap depot and left them what's called for scrap. So uh, after the war, the parents of these children all had to go out and buy them new trains, and that was one of the big periods. Now, trains for so many of the years, since 1900, when uh, Joshua Lionel started with all of this stuff, they were basically toys for kids. That's right. That's right. But now they have become collector's items. They, they were they? toys for kids into the 60s. Mm -hmm. And Lionel, during the 60s, started to make space trains, and this was one of the parts they got away from the traditional train and went into space and military. Mm -hmm. From the top secret carbon of the Lionel Corporation comes the most advanced military train ever developed. Looks like an ordinary freight, but at this very moment, military engineers within are receiving the exact position of an enemy ammunition train. The innocent looking freight car roof swings open. The Minute Man fires. Mission accomplished. Enemy target destroyed. Another Lionel train speeds to the attack, roaring along over sturdy trestles. 
Lionel takes you into the space age with this exciting satellite launcher. And this huge missile that blasts off into space with its astronaut carrying Mercury capsule. What is the most collectible of all of the Lionel trains over all the, all the you know? Well, this depends what period we're in. There's mm -hmm. The most collectible, I feel, is the late 30s. Mm -hmm. When Lionel made copies of the Union Pacific M10,000, which was an Art Deco type of streamlined train that the Union Pacific made, mm -hmm. uh, they also made a copy of the Milwaukee Road Hiawatha that ran between Chicago and Milwaukee mm -hmm. and up into yeah. Minneapolis. Those are very collectible. Uh, for most collectors, they say to Hudson, Joshua Lionel Cowan brought out a scale model Hudson in the late 30s which sold for $75 to $100 in the days when people were making mm -hmm. $12 a yes, week. Uh -huh. That train was made from 37 through about 1941. It was then reissued under another number in the early 50s. It was reissued under another number in the middle 60s. And just last year and this year, Lionel has reissued it under another number. The Hudson, for most collectors, is considered the most desirable collectible piece. Does a collector, a real, dyed-in-the-wool, true collector of model railroad uh, equipment, does he get every incarnation of that Hudson over the years? Well, that's, that's really the way uh -huh. it goes. To get every Lionel train that mm -hmm. was ever built, every different type, you would probably need a museum as big as the Museum of Science and Industry to house them in. <laughs> so what happens is most people start out with the idea of getting one mm -hmm. of everything that was ever built. Someplace along the line, they find out that you just can't do that. We have one customer of ours that tries to get every variation of the Hudson, because even mm -hmm. though it was made uh, in four or five separate series, each year there might be two or three variations because of uh, factory runs, because of a different paint job, because they ran out of one color of paint. Mm -hmm. These collectibles happen because of not mistakes at the factory, but because when somebody says, we're out of this color uh, gray paint, will use something that's two shades uh, darker or lighter, it really doesn't make any difference. Well, years later, it does make a difference to a collector. But the, the factory doesn't uh, uh, enjoy any increase in no, value in the collector's market, not right? Lionel <laughs> today does not make collectibles. Mm -hmm. They make operating, running electric trains. It is the people out in the field who buy these things mm -hmm. who make them collectible. Now, certain Lionel trains that are made today are made in small runs, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Uh, as long as they're available from a dealer, they're not really collectible. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the last dealer has sold the last one, they start trading between collectors. And that's mm -hmm. where the value mm -hmm. goes up. A train that someone want, might buy today, uh, not for his kid, but for himself, say, oh, I love this train, I remember trains like this, right. I want to have it, and he buys uh, a decent set today. How much is that going to cost? Today, to buy a decent set for an adult, he's going to be in the $500 price category. And that's with the engine, the engine, cold car, right. or whatever? Though. So a few cars behind it, some mm -hmm. track and a transformer, mm -hmm. enough to get him running. Okay, now in five years from now, what might that be worth? Might be worth $100. On yeah, the other okay. hand, might be worth $1,000. The funny part of it is, if we knew which one of these trains were going to be valuable, <laughs> yeah. we'd save those and sell mm -hmm. them later. We don't know. Uh, back a few years ago, Lionel brought out a GG1. That's an electric Pennsylvania locomotive. Mm -hmm. In the 50s, they made that locomotive in green, and they made it in a Tuscan, which is a maroon color. And it's highly collectible. In the late 70s, they came out with it in Tuscan and maroon again. Everybody wanted them because they were like the originals. And they also came out with a black one, and it didn't say mm -hmm. Pennsylvania on it, it said Penn Central, which mm -hmm. is a new, of mm -hmm. course, road name. Nobody wanted the black Penn Central, even to the point of people buying the black Penn Central and having them repainted, either yeah. Tuscan or green, <laughs> and saying Pennsylvania on uh -huh. it. Today, the green one and the maroon one are collectible, of course, and they've gone up a few dollars. The black one, which nobody wanted when it was new, is now the most highly prized one. It's so a fascinating never world. So you fascinating never tell. world. Now, lots of trains that were in individual collections over all the years, uh, they've gotten beat up. They've gotten uh, broken. They've gotten damaged. They've gotten rusty. 
And there's a big market for those things as they're restored, too, aren't oh, there? Oh, yes, isn't definitely. It? Definitely. We're told there are many of these trains were left in attics, and of course, mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of them were left in basements where they corroded and rusted. And we find today that there are people that are selling these, of course, and we restore them and resell mm -hmm. them. And there are also people that would like to have them restored for themselves so they can put them back on a shelf and have it just the way it was when they opened up the box in the 30s or the 40s or the 50s. Well, I know you do an awful lot of work in restoration of train sets. And we're going to take a little break. And we come back, I'd like you to uh, show us what kind of work goes into that. Okay, Chuck, okay? we'll be glad to. All right, we'll be right back. Stick around and don't touch that channel. There's an old-fashioned warm Christmas spirit at Townhouse TV and Appliances. Maybe it's the smiles that greet you. Maybe it's the dolls. Maybe it's the Lionel trains. Let a good memory from Christmas past, Lionel, make its way to Christmas present. This Christmas, why just give a toy when you can give a tradition? Lionel. Come to the Superstore, Townhouse TV and Appliances, Milwaukee and Alton. You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at Metro Golden Memories in Chicago. We have a complete selection of records and cassette tapes from the fabulous big band era, plus thousands of personality recordings by your favorite singers. We offer a gigantic collection of books about the movies and the stars from those wonderful days of not so long ago. At Metro Golden Memories, you'll find a marvelous collection of celebrity statues, plus our famous Maltese Falcon replica, the Oscar lookalike, even Little Nipper the RCA dog, hundreds of old-time radio shows on record and tape, and lots of books about radio and television, too. Posters of your favorite movies and movie stars, and videotapes of the classic films from Hollywood's golden age. Hundreds in stock for sale or rent. All this and more at Metro Golden Memories, 5425 West Addison, just two miles west of the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago. Open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and browse. Our guest is Mike Moore of Townhouse TV and Appliances, and now we've come to Mike Moore's inner sanctum in the back of the model electric train department at Townhouse. And, and Mike, uh, this, is, uh, this is your inner sanctum, and, and you're wearing your, uh, your doctor of uh, trinology. Do doctor of restorology. Doctor of restorology uh, schmuck, right? Schmuck, that's my yeah. schmuck, you, yes, sir. You, you go into a telephone booth and put this on? Is that it? Uh... <laughs> no, these, these are my dress whites. We use this one for TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you're, in, you're dressed perfectly today. Now, somebody comes in with a really a beat-up old electric train. A beat-up old train. Parts are missing. It doesn't look like it could ever be salvaged. And yet you say, hey, that's a challenge, one, right? One much like this, Chuck. Like that. Now, what is this train? This is the tail end car, the observation car from mm -hmm. the Lionel M10,000 from the 30s we were talking about. This train was built between 1934 and 1938. Uh -huh. And this example here is about 80% complete. Uh, there's a lot of paint missing. There's a lot of rust on it. There's a lot of corrosion. You can see this has probably been laying in a basement someplace in a wet cardboard Ooh. box for many years. The wheels are missing on the truck here. This is usually the condition they come in. Ooh. Now, a piece like this, we would take and, uh, first of all, find the missing parts. And I get a lot of the missing parts by going to flea markets Ooh. and train shows. Plus, some of these parts are remanufactured today, just like they are for old cars. I mean, you can buy parts. You can buy parts because, mm -hmm. remember, Lionel still makes parts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the parts are very common from year to year. A lot of the parts that are used on new 1986 trains are essentially the same parts but better built mm -hmm. than were used in the 30s. And on, are, are many of the parts interchangeable from oh, yes. one train to the oh, next? Yes. They're that, standard? That was the one amazing thing about Lionel. You'll find that a part number usually describes the number the first model that it was used on, mm -hmm. but the same part could have been used on a hundred different items over a period of 30 or 40 years. They were very adaptable. Mm -hmm. Instead of making new items every year, new parts, they would use a gear, use a wheel that was used on a previous machine. And uh, as a result, a lot of this stuff is still available. So that's the, the first thing you start out with is to make sure you, you what you don't have, you right. get. Right. We, we make sure we got all the pieces that we need. Mm -hmm. Then we would take a piece like this over here mm -hmm. and take it apart to its last piece. Now, the nice thing about Lionel trains 
is everything comes apart with screws and nuts and bolts and tabs. And you would take this thing apart down to its last piece. You take off the roof and the tail end piece, the windows, the belly pan. Mm -hmm. After we've taken the whole thing apart, we take each individual piece and we would sandblast it, acid etch it, and make it look like a new piece of metal. Now that's every screw, every clip, every nut, every washer, everything we can is then sandblasted. The next step now, would be... Before you go on, how, how long does that take to do that? Well, to take a piece like this and sandblast it, mm -hmm. if it's not uh, real rusty, if it just has paint on it and a little mm -hmm. corrosion, this can be sandblasted in 10 to 15 minutes. Now, if it's real rusty? Well, it may take a half an hour. Mm -hmm. Then you may have to take the piece and dip it in a pan of phosphoric acid, just like they would in a body and fender shop, mm -hmm. to eat away at rust. Now, if there's too much rust, when the rust is all gone, instead of having a nice finish, you'll have pock marks. Mm -hmm. That's where the next step comes in. Priming. You would want to put a primer finish mm -hmm. on it. And then at a spot where there's a big hunk or a big rust mark or corrosion mark where pieces have been eaten out. Once you've got them clean, then you'd put in a filler. Mm -hmm. Now when this filler dries like this one has here, we then want to sand it down much like body and fender work, mm -hmm. much like restoring an automobile. When we have the pieces cleaned, when we have them primed, filled, they would be primed another time. Then the pieces are then taken and painted. I see. Mm -hmm. And you put on a new finish, inside, outside, all around. We just don't paint the outside where you can see. This is now painted just like the original one was. We also take the body. It is then repainted inside, mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. These parts now are the same as the parts that were on the Lionel assembly line in the 30. Now we take these parts and we start to put them together. We then re-letter the sides with the mm -hmm. words Lionel Lines Union Pacific. Now do you do that by hand? You, no, what's called, that's the one thing we had to several years ago, do them by hand. Now the restoration part of this hobby has gotten so big, there are people that make not decals, but dry transfers. All the lettering on wax paper, painted. So when you lay the wax paper on top of your uh, body mm -hmm. and you rub it with the end of a toothpick or a matchstick, you transfer the painted image on the wax paper to here. And you come up with the same kind of lettering that you did at the factory, where it was nice. put on with a stencil or it was put on uh, with a roller. And they have recreated the exact They've re same uh, type exactly style. Same. So now, I don't know if you can see here the type style here. Yeah, let's, let's look at this uh, Union Pacific, Pacific I line of lines number 754. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, here is one that is finished. This one has been done. It's been completely painted. Uh, a few of the wheels have been replaced. The pickups have been replaced. Mm -hmm. The windows have been replaced. And what, you are can the, see, what are the windows? That's a, uh, it used to be celluloid back in the mm -hmm. 30s. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's an acrylic plastic. I see. And there it is. So it's all in there. Union all Pacific. in there. The numbers, Union Pacific, lettered exactly the same. Because the people that would make the dry transfers would make them off of mm -hmm. an original copy. I see. Oh, I see. I see. And mm -hmm. little things here like little tail lights in the back when the, there are lights inside this car. Mm -hmm. When they light up, these light up red. Needless to say, what's called a little piece of uh, red plastic, red celluloid. Mm -hmm. uh, you make these with a paper punch. They're exactly the oh, same yeah. size. A lot of things <laughs> at Lionel were done mm -hmm. because of materials and tools at hand. But a standard notebook paper punch punches plastic exactly the same size as the headlights and the taillights on most of the trains. And then it's just held in by a glue or something. A little, little drop of glue. Uh -huh. uh, a little crazy glue, super glue, goes a long way in uh -huh. this hobby. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is one, one car. Now, this is one car. Now, a, an average train, the Union Pacific, would be how many cars? This would be four cars. A Union Pacific would have a tail car, observation car, would have two passenger cars, and would have an engine on mm -hmm. the front. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if... You, you can see one back here. Back I can get one for you if you'd like, Chuck. All right, let's see if we can get one. This is an amazing recreation. This is the tail end of this uh, Union Pacific car. It's got the works in there, and it's ready to roll with this engine. And this is a restored engine now? This is a restored body of uh -huh. the front end. Oh, and, that's this. I and that's see. exactly the same as this one uh -huh. over here. Uh -huh. And the motor still has to be put in here, the oh, motor and the wheels. 
And here would be a, a tail car. Here is a middle car. The whole business, huh? Now, when you're all through with this, this then is a working, running train. It runs like it did when it was brand uh -huh. new, uh -huh. and it looks like it did when it was brand new. 100%. Our restorations are not just cosmetic on the top. It's not just a quickie paint job so it looks nice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every piece, both mechanically and physically, is as close to new as original. And you can put it on a track, you can run it like you did in the 30s, uh, or you can put it on a shelf and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Now, this whole train came in in this more or less beat up condition, although it's probably more of the paint job on here than anything. That's right. In this particular That's right. case. Now, From the day this came in to the day, and I guess you're still not exactly finished with this, how long could would you expect to take to well, restore Well, something this? like this would take about three months. Three months? Three months. Now, remember, Chuck, we're not talking about uh, nine to five every day, mm -hmm. you know, five days mm -hmm. a week. In actual hours, about a hundred hours. But mm -hmm. a lot of this is done on the basis of uh, one day I take apart one car. I don't like to restore ten pieces at once. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets monotonous. It gets to be a job. So I'll restore one car completely. Mm -hmm. Then I'll start on a second car. Even though some people would like to paint all of the pieces the same color mm -hmm. at the same time, I don't do that. I'll restore one car at a time. I'll take it apart completely, and then little by little, uh, one evening, one afternoon, when I have some spare time, we'll sandblast it. Mm -hmm. We'll do these pieces. Sometimes a piece will be painted or primed. It'll hang for a couple, three days. It'll hang for a couple weeks. So the whole job will take about three months, but in actual hours, about 100 mm -hmm. hours of time. It's a labor of love for That's you. That's what it is. And it's a relaxing hobby for you? I do this mm -hmm. most of the time after the store is closed mm -hmm. in the evening. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something I can do on demand. Yeah. If a person came in and gave me a train and says, I need this done next week, mm -hmm. it's work now. No matter yeah. what the charge would be for it, it still works. It still works. But if I can put it on the shelf and do it when the spirit moves me, mm -hmm. when I feel creative, <laughs> Or like a couple of people in a train department say to me, they say, do, I, do I feel artistic tonight? <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I feel that way, then I'll do one. What's the toughest job you ever had on a train restoration? Oh, I guess the toughest job I ever had was a fellow who came in with an American Flyer train set, oh, five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. Happened to be the Milwaukee Road, Hiawatha. This gentleman is in his 60s. He was given the train brand new by his father in 1934. Now his father bought the train from the American Flyer resale shop on Halstead and 22nd Street. So this train was one that was returned by somebody. It was a factory defect. It was a service problem. And it ended up at the American Flyer resale shop where it was fixed and resold uh, for a lesser price. Now his father bought it for him in 1934. He used it like any young boy would use it and probably had plenty of train wrecks like the Adams family used to have on television with their train sets. He had eight brothers who used the train up until the Second World War. At that time when he was married and started to have children, the train passed through his children, then passed through his brother's children. Mm -hmm. Now this train had gone through about 10 to 12 sets of boys over a period of 30 years. He acquired the train from one of his brother's uh, kids when they didn't want it anymore and they uh, were going to throw it away, and he brought it in to me. Uh, you can just imagine the condition of this train, not only the use of 12 boys, but also the basement uh, storage, underwater. Uh, that restoration took about two years. Now, again, I'm not going to say we're two years in mm -hmm. time, but it was two years total in acquiring parts. Mm -hmm. American Flyer parts are not as easy to get as Lionel parts and acquiring decals, uh, acquiring wheels, acquiring mm -hmm. grommets and gaskets and little parts for it. We finished it about two years ago. The gentleman is very happy with it. From what I understand, he ran it around the tree once. It now mm -hmm. sits on his fireplace in a plexiglass <laughs> box. But after all that usage, there was just not much left of the train because, you know, over a period of years, what happens when a screw or nut falls off? Mm -hmm. I don't know if when you were a kid, Chuck, you didn't have a machine screw with a nut, so you, you found an old wood screw someplace, mm -hmm. so you stuck mm -hmm. it in. And after old wood screws and sheet metal screws have been put into things over a period <laughs> of years, it makes it a little harder. Yeah. Maybe the second hardest one I had was a gentleman who brought in a small engine, 
And when he was a kid, now this engine was from the 30s, from the early 30s, him and his brother used to put it on the fence when they got a little older and shoot a 22 at it for target practice. The train actually had several bullet holes through the boiler, which had to be straightened out, brazed, mm -hmm. sanded. Like I say, it's, it's much like restoring an automobile. It's, most of the paint and of supplies that we use to restore these are bought from an automobile body and fender mm -hmm. uh, supply shop. Now, has there ever been a, a train set come into you in such a bad shape that you looked at it and said, I can't do anything with this, or it isn't worth doing anything with it? Yeah, well, when you say can't do anything mm -hmm. with it, like the man says, if you want to spend enough time and enough money on anything, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. do something with it. I do have a train set right now that I've been accumulating parts for. Uh, matter of fact, uh, it's been about five years. Mm -hmm. I'm still at, not at the point where I would want to restore it because I don't have enough of the parts. That one is still sitting and waiting for parts, and the customer knows that when mm -hmm. we get to a certain point, when we have enough parts, we'll start on it. Uh, yes, we've had people come in with train sets. Now, you, you know a lot of these are not worth a lot of money. Mm -hmm. There are some trains that sold 40 years ago for $10 that are worth 11 today. And there are some of them uh, that just aren't worth repairing for resale. But if a person comes in and says, I don't care what it costs, this was my train when I had it when I was a, when I was a kid, it can be restored. It may not be worth it to me or to you mm -hmm. because you can replace it. But this person does not want to replace it. He wants the one he had when he was a child. Well, you've restored our faith in model electric trains, and I thank you very much for uh, all the time and uh, your talent, Mike. You've got a great talent to restore these things to a beautiful uh, condition again, and I think not only do you make other people happy, I think you make yourself happy doing well, all this, don't that, you? That's why we do it. Okay, now we're going to continue with our look at model electric trains, and you're going to see the most amazing collection in operation when we return. So stick around and don't touch that channel. The Mysterious Traveler. The Jimmy Durante Show. X, 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 minus, 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 one, one, one. Bibber McGee and Molly. The Amos and Andy Show. Suspense. Town Hall tonight. Philco Radio Time. The Tom Nix Ralston Straight Shooters. The Guiding Light. Can you top this? Tom Corbett. Face to death. Henry. Henry Aldrich. Coming, Mother. True Detective Mysteries. There's an old-fashioned warm Christmas spirit at Townhouse TV and Appliances. Maybe it's the smiles that greet you. Maybe it's the dolls. Maybe it's the Lionel trains. Let a good memory from Christmas past, Lionel, make its way to Christmas present. This Christmas, why just give a toy when you can give a tradition? Lionel. Come to the Superstore, Townhouse TV and Appliances, Milwaukee and Alton. You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at Metro Golden Memories in Chicago. We have a complete selection of records and cassette tapes from the fabulous big band era, plus thousands of personality recordings by your favorite singers. We offer a gigantic collection of books about the movies and the stars from those wonderful days of not so long ago. At Metro Golden Memories, you'll find a marvelous collection of celebrity statues, plus our famous Maltese Falcon replica, the Oscar lookalike, even Little Nipper the RCA dog, hundreds of old-time radio shows on record and tape, and lots of books about radio and television, too. Posters of your favorite movies and movie stars, and videotapes of the classic films from Hollywood's golden age. Hundreds in stock for sale or rent. All this and more at Metro Golden Memories, 5425 West Addison, just two miles west of the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago. Open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and browse. Hi, I'm Johnny Cash. You know, kids get something wonderful when they get a Lionel train. They get that. Chugging round the tree on Christmas Day. Can't you hear that Lionel train? Can't wait till my boy gets to run that line. I'll never tell him that it's really mine. Lionel, Lionel. Now it has the mighty sound of steam. We have come to Stanleyville in north suburban Chicago to see one of the greatest uh, model train layouts in the country, I think. I've never seen anything like this, and this belongs to a fellow by the name of Stan Roy. And Stan, this is amazing. How much 
space do you have here devoted to uh, model trains? Well, I would say I have uh, most of my basement in my house. Uh, I never really measured uh, how many feet. The layout itself is probably about 50 feet long by 14 feet wide. It's in, in an L shape, and then there's a, another section that's uh, also about 35 feet long and 10 feet wide. So all I know is that uh, it's taken a lot of work and it's taken a lot of space. <laughs> How long have you been working on this tr particular layout, this layout? Well, this, this particular layout, probably in excess of 12 years. And you've been into model railroading for how long? Well, I started, I've been in Chicago for about uh, 17 years, so I started about 17 years ago, but I've only been in this particular house. I, st I had some smaller layouts in other houses, but mm -hmm. uh, nothing like this. Was there a connection between your coming to Chicago and your getting involved with the model railroading? No, I, no. Uh, I was uh, actually in the building business back in the East Coast, and I came back to get into the electronics business here in the Chicago area. And I guess one thing just led to another, and I just got into model railroading. As a kid, did you have a, 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 a Lionel train set like so many of us did? Well, I think what's interesting is that there was always this feud as to what was a better train when we were kids, American Flyer or Lionel. Uh -huh. And uh, I was in a position, I guess, through what my father could buy me. He always bought me an American Flyer train. And I always felt that Lionel was better. So I guess I got even with everybody and just went out and bought every <laughs> Lionel train I could find. This is all Lionel. Everything in here is right. Lionel? Well, how many trains, how many actual trains do you have in this fantastic layout? I would say in excess of uh, a thousand. A thousand individual train cars, okay? I probably have a uh, hundred or so engines. Uh, but, you know. <laughs> and how many work at one time? Well, I've uh, tried to get as many as 26 or 27 running at the same time. Now, this is a lot different than the guy, average guy who has a small 8 by 10 table in his basement with a hole in the middle of it so he can stand there and, and engineer the whole, the whole business. You have, uh, uh, well, this is an electronic uh, wizardry here, too, isn't it? Well... Uh, everybody asks me the same question. They say, uh, is this run by a computer? Technically, the answer is yes, but in modern day terms, the answer is no. Okay, because the basis for the computers of today were the original electrical me electromechanical switching mechanisms uh, called relays mm -hmm. of the past. And the concept of running these trains are basically uh, relays, which are mechanical devices which transfer electricity. So, but it really is. Uh, you could say it's a computer. Now, when I had a train at home, uh, it was a circle or an oval. Mm -hmm. uh, on, around, the, we never put it under the Christmas tree at Christmas time. It was in the house after Christmas, and it would just go in a circle, in a circle, in a circle, and that was it. We didn't even bother with a figure eight. But uh, sometimes it would uh, it would chug to a stop, no matter what I'm doing with that transformer. And once in a while, a friend of mine would bring uh, his engine and a coal car over there. We put the two of them on there. And then both trains would seem to go slower than that. Now you have so many different trains that go all at one time. What's the, what? How do you keep them all going at one time? Okay. Well, I guess the biggest the biggest change that I had to make was that if you buy original Lionel trains or whatever, you get uh, what they call AC transformers, alternating current transformers. And they're okay, but they're only okay to run one, possibly two trains at the same time. So the first thought that I had was how am I going to get these trains to run at a constant speed uh, I don't even know if we basically talked yet about the stopping and starting but the whole key to the layout is the automation mm -hmm. of the layout mm -hmm. the fact that the trains are crossing each other's path uh, if one train stops at a station the train behind it will automatically stop and then when the other train pulls out the train behind it will automatically pull out the whole key to doing this is using these relays and using direct current which you could regulate and what I had to do is design uh, numerous power supplies to be able to make all the trains run at a constant speed. Uh, for an example, if one train is running as opposed to five trains are running, we still want them to go and not slow down or you know, speed up. Now, you avoid collisions <laughs> as we look at this layout here. One train slows up, stops, while the other one goes by, and then, and then it takes off on its same path. Now, how is that accomplished? You say you've got a lot of relays and all that. You have actually electronically programmed this whole thing, then, haven't you? Right. What we're using as a switch is the track itself. Mm -hmm. uh, most people know, I guess if they're involved with uh, Lionel trains, that there are three tracks. 
Okay, so the key to the, the whole automation is to insulate one of the three tracks. It's not really the third rail. The third rail they, they call the inside rail, but what we do is insulate one of the outside rails. As the train crosses the track, it just bridges the two outside rails, making, let's say it's going to ground the, the rail that's insulated, and that ground then operates the relay. So what we do is we take the relay and have it connected to I actually should have a piece of paper and pencil or whatever, but assuming we have a cross track, okay? What we'll do is, as the relay energizes, it will take the voltage away from the center section of the opposing train, so that one train is then basically telling the other train to stop. Now you say you, you, you constructed most of this yourself, or all of it yourself. It's, it looks fantastic it looks absolutely perfect but it was of course built in stages uh -huh. I've done the entire wiring and the electronics myself mm -hmm. but I did have some help with the scenery we have schoolhouses and airports and whatever mm -hmm. and uh, my brother-in-law Bob Richmond uh, who is a design architect has helped me tremendously in uh, doing the shrubbery work and the, you know developing the mountains and whatever uh, I guess the stages were that, uh, just like anything else, I would start at the bottom, which would be, you know, the bottom level. And this, this was really a progression. In fact, the last, the third level has only been done about seven months ago. And I, I did the first level, obviously, then I did the second level, and then I, I, I tried to make a lot of intricate circuits so that it's just not trains running around in circles and whatever. I have a passenger station on the other side of the layout that the trains automatically stop and start as they come into the station and another one pulls out. The freight train automatically goes through. And, you know, basically there's, there's a lot of little things. The, uh, you know, the top section over here, I have trains that automatically whistle as they go over the bridges. The men go down when they go underneath the bridges and whatever. But it's been a transition type situation whereby I just kept adding and adding until I think I'm finally at my limit. Well, I think one of the key things that, uh, I guess my philosophy, is that if you have a train, I think you should run it. I'd be the first one to admit that there are people with layouts that are, not layouts, but collections that are 10 to 15 times b bigger than my layout. But, uh, you know, my feeling is what do they do? Kiss them all goodnight? You know, when they, when they go to bed. My feeling was, if I'm going to have a train, I'm going to run it. And I'd be the first one also to admit that this particular hobby, just like anybody else who collects, uh, like the comic books that you had or the old-time radios or, or whatever, it's a sickness. And you just, you continue to collect. And my idea was, if I can't stop collecting, at least I'm going to be in a position whereby I can run all the trains. And how often do you run the trains? Well, at the present stage, what I do is I usually do it uh, for people that come over. Mm -hmm. Somebody will hear about it. I've been in you know, a couple of national magazines, and people will call me up and say, well, can I bring my kids over to see the trains? And I, I say yes to everybody. I mean, I want everybody to be able to see it, the kids and whatever. Uh, the fun of it really is in creating all the automation. So to answer your question, uh, Actually running the trains, maybe I run them a half hour a week or something like that. But to work on them, I could be working on them 10 hours a week. As little as that? As little as 10 hours a Now, week? now. <laughs> I, I have had, you know, situations where I would work on them until 7 in the morning until uh, 3 o'clock, uh, you know, in the morning. I just, uh, just around the clock. And I just do this and just to the point where uh, it was an obsession. And... I, I've gotten it to the stage now where it's pretty well done, pretty well automated, and just about only thing left to do is just to show it to everybody. But that doesn't sound like a true collector. What are you going to do? What are you, you going to do about it? Are you just going to show it to people now, or are you going to you're going to uh, ultimately look at it and say, well, I think I'll change this, or I'll tear it apart, or do something, or say, the heck with this, I'm going into model airplanes. No, I think what I'll do is <laughs> I'll continue to collect, mm -hmm. okay, which I have been doing, and uh, like I mentioned, the third level is strictly for the, you know, the last 15 train sets that I bought. I had no place to display them. How far back do you go with your trains? What is the oldest train in your uh, collection and your layout here? Probably about 40 years, maybe 45 mm -hmm. years. Uh, the, a lot of the older trains you can pick up at the train meets. Mm -hmm. Every weekend there's a train meet in one of the suburbs where you can pick up a lot of the old stuff. The new stuff you have to buy from, from the dealers. I personally, and a lot of people will disagree with me, 
But I personally feel that the, the Lionel collector trains of today are far superior to the trains of yesterday. I mean, they're painted, uh, you know, much more colorful. Uh, they, they operate better. They, they run better. And I think that, uh, you know, I don't have all of the invaluable trains of yesterday, but I do have all the, I guess, 20 years from now, someone to say, you do have all the invaluable trains of today. We're going to break for a moment or two, and then we'll have some more fun here in Stanleyville and the model train layout of Stan Roy. Stick around and don't touch that channel. There's an old-fashioned warm Christmas spirit at Townhouse TV and Appliances. Maybe it's the smiles that greet you. Maybe it's the dolls. Maybe it's the Lionel trains. Let a good memory from Christmas past, Lionel, make its way to Christmas present. This Christmas, why just give a toy when you can give a tradition? Lionel. Come to the Superstore, Townhouse TV and Appliances, Milwaukee and Oakton. You'll find a generous helping of memories from and about the good old days at Metro Golden Memories in Chicago. We have a complete selection of records and cassette tapes from the fabulous big band era, plus thousands of personality recordings by your favorite singers. We offer a gigantic collection of books about the movies and the stars from those wonderful days of not so long ago. At Metro Golden Memories, you'll find a marvelous collection of celebrity statues, plus our famous Maltese Falcon replica, the Oscar lookalike, even Little Nipper the RCA dog, hundreds of old-time radio shows on record and tape, and lots of books about radio and television, too, posters of your favorite movies and movie stars, and videotapes of the classic films from Hollywood's golden age, hundreds in stock for sale or rent. All this and more at Metro Golden Memories, 5425 West Addison, just two miles west of the Kennedy Expressway in Chicago. Open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday from 10 to 6, Sunday from noon to 5. Come in and browse. That's one small step for man. Share the experience. The candidates need and to And unlock the memories. At Chicago's Museum of Broadcast Communications. Director of the Mercury Theater and, and for the latest uh, local results. Celebrating the very best in radio, television, and advertising. For membership information, call 565 1950. Chicago's new Museum of Broadcast Communications. Come share the experience. Is there any train uh, in, that has ever been manufactured that you really want to have and haven't been able to get? for your collection? Well, there was one train, but Lionel took care of that. It was the, I guess the most acclaimed train is the Lionel Hudson. Mm -hmm. And that was a train that I guess escaped everybody uh, many years ago. And they were very, very difficult to get a hold of. In fact, you could buy them. They were in the neighborhood of uh, like $1,000 or so. And they were not in real good condition. Mm -hmm. And just recently, Lionel reissued the Hudson. Obviously, I did buy that one. And just to give you an idea, I bought it for about $650. It's worth about 1100 already, and I've only had it for about seven months. It was a limited edition also. So I would say that if there was any one train, it would have been that. And now that I have it, I, you know, I don't need to go back and buy any of the old trains. I did do that with the accessories. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of the... Lionel has not reissued a lot of the original accessories. So I've searched around. I, in every place... Every, I, I travel a lot. So every time I get into a different city, I'll look up... Uh, you know, some model railroading uh, stores, toy stores or whatever, and I'll go in there. And a lot of the people have been in the business for 30, 40 years, and they have older trains or whatever, or some flea markets, you know, on occasion. And I'll, I have now collected probably every accessory Lionel has ever made, with the originals. So Every accessory Lionel has ever made? Yeah. This collection and this layout is really priceless. It's, priceless really is the word for it. You've been talking a little bit about how much this train costs and how much that train costs and the value of it increasing. And we know that it, you can go to the store and buy a new Lionel train set, whether a collector's edition or a current edition, and you know how much that costs. But you take that and you take so many uh, sets from years past and then you put them in a layout like this, there really is hardly a monetary value for it. It's just a priceless collection. And uh, you must have a lot of canceled checks uh, <laughs> to support this hobby of so many years. Somebody told me a, um, a little story once, and I thought it was, I thought it was humorous. Uh, and I think a lot of the collectors who see this tape are going to feel the same way. They want to collect this, and in a way, they're trying to hide it from their wife. 
<laughs> so one of the things that happens is that you, if your wife comes down and you know she sees something and she says to you, uh, "Well, what is this worth?" and you play it down. You know, it could be you might have just spent five hundred dollars for a train. Is ah, I picked it up at the you know the some flea market for ten dollars or fifty dollars or whatever. So you never really tell anybody what it's worth. And one of the well, the tricks was is that when you come home from one of these flea markets you leave most of the stuff in the trunk of your car, you know, and you come home and you bring in one train, she says, well, what did you get? And you say, well, I got this one car, you know, and it, was, it was a bad day, right? And then next opportunity you get, whether she's sleeping or she's out of the house or whatever, you go back into the, into the trunk of the car, you take all this stuff and you immediately bring it downstairs and you put it on the track, which, you know, I'm obviously, you know, guilty of, and then she doesn't know what, it, what it's worth. But one of the sad stories, I, I, I heard something uh, one time, somebody was collecting guns, and he did basically the same thing, and he kept telling his wife his gun collection was, it wasn't worth anything. He passed away, and of course, maybe some people knew that he had a good gun collection. They came in, and she just thought it was worthless. So she, gave, she just about gave away his gun collection. I don't want that to happen. Uh, my wife knows, you know, what it's worth. Uh, there's a lot of time and effort, obviously, that's been put on here that you can't really put down in black and white. I mean, I, I don't think the, the hours are incredible, but if I had to put a figure on it, I would say we're probably close to $100,000. I just happen to have $100,000 with me today and wondered if you would sell this set to me right now. Well, the answer to that question is no, and I probably wouldn't sell it for $200,000. In fact, I don't think I would sell anything that I have here. Uh, what will happen in later years, I just, you know, I close my eyes, I have this dream that, uh, you know, let's say I gave it to my son or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, he'll probably disassemble it and trade it in for a Corvette or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I think that as long as I'm around, I probably will never sell any of it. Would you like to see it maybe be preserved someplace in some kind of a railroading museum or some kind of a operation like that? I've thought of it. Uh -huh. I've actually thought of it. Uh, I think that uh, if you know, some of the articles that have been written about mm -hmm. me. Uh, I did this like in a vacuum. Uh, there's, I'm obviously a member of a lot of the train collecting societies, mm -hmm. but nobody really knows that this exists. Uh, Tom McComas is coming out with a book, The Greatest Toy Train Layouts uh, in Existence, and obviously this layout is going to be in it, and maybe that'll be just an indication to, you know, some of the people in, in the country that uh, a Lionel train layout such as this does exist. Well, everybody in the country can't come down to your home and see this layout, and uh, we're glad to have this opportunity to, uh, to bring our nostalgia cameras here to uh, get a, a small cross-section of the people in the country to, to take a look at this, and we really appreciate you letting us uh, see it. Well, I certainly appreciate the opportunity uh, of you coming down here and, and filming the layout for me, and uh, I thank you very, very much. Stan, uh, I hope we can see this grow and grow and wish you a lot of luck with taking a lot of time and a lot of effort, and it really shows. It's a priceless collection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan. And so on Christmas morning, when Johnny and his sister come bouncing into the living room to behold the eighth wonder of the world, it'd be nice if they knew the story behind electric trains. But of course, it's Christmas, and Johnny's too excited to be bothered with stories today. It's an old, old story, Johnny. And that goes for the part where Pop starts telling you how to run her. Don't let him. You'll never get him away from her if you do. Well, you've got your train, young fellow. You can drive her any way you want. To California, South Setauket, or Timbuktu. So take her away, Johnny. You're Casey Jones III, boss of the Iron Pony. Oh boy, I love these trains. This is really, this has been an awful lot of fun for me, spending an hour this month with model railroading and a couple of people who really know their stuff about uh, collecting and trains. I hope you've enjoyed uh, watching. And whether you're a collector of the old trains or whether you grew up with them, I hope you had as much fun as I did this time. We'll see you next time. This is Chuck Shaden. Thanks for watching. Christmas 
morning at last. What wild and wonderful dreams are waiting to come true beneath this tree. A certain present here will make this Christmas the one to be remembered always. A Lionel electric train. It will grow in value and importance during the years ahead by giving these children a sense of responsibility while the whole family has loads of fun.